All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is, what, is this the fifth installment now or the sixth? I, what was it? Two for the Iliad? Two for the Iliad. Iliad, Aeschylus, and Sophocles. So that would make this the fifth? Yes. Iliad, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Homer. No, so this is the sixth. This is the sixth. Well, anyway, welcome, everyone, to the sixth installment of uh, Max and Doyle making our way through the great books of the Western tradition. Um, I was thinking a, like a good subtitle for whatever title we had ever come up with for this podcast could be something like Max and Doyle seeking proper education. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, except I'm even more confused now than when we started, which I See, guess is the point. I am too. I I really was expecting by this point to be kind of discerning like i don't know i feel like we're like whittling a stick into a spear and i was kind of expecting to have a sharp thing by this point and it still seems pretty dull and and by that i mean you know we're exposing ourselves to the great ideas and really the ideas that are at the very foundation of our culture and rather than hmm, what is it doing it's almost having kind of like a nostalgic effect on me in like a perhaps not so good way because I'm starting to wonder whether or not Western culture is redeemable. <laughs> it, it also plays on the, the distinction between the ancient and the modern for me emotionally mm -hmm. because there's so much that I love in these texts and yet so much of them is so alien to the world that I inhabit. So right. it's almost, I, I had that same intuition. It's almost as if I wonder that some of the best parts of Western culture can ever be reborn. Mm -hmm. And I think probably part of our fear will be alleviated as we witness the transition from ancient to modern through the Middle Ages and the early modern texts. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm still relatively hopeful. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad we've embarked on this project and I thought that I've learned a lot about, I think that I've learned a lot about myself in the process. Um, and ultimately if nothing else, it's teaching me how to read. Certainly there's that base level of having to read something every week and be able to talk about it after. Mm -hmm. I also think that one good description of it would be, uh, I think this comes from Sam Harris, but it's um, reading very confused people who are writing to very confused people. Mm. <laughs> that sounds about right. That sounds about it, right. It's sort of, you know, everyone, um, at least I did when I was a freshman uh, in philosophy, I thought that a text had to be either completely true of the world or completely false of it. And each work that we've read just gets at a narrow sliver of human realities. Yeah. Well, and Plato is even more difficult for that reason because the author doesn't have a voice in any of his texts. He speaks through all of the characters simultaneously. And in the symposium, not even a thesis necessarily. Right. Right. And yeah, I mean, so I guess what would be a good way to go about this? Because Maybe I, we can give a little bit of overarching structure to how the how the dialogue plays out, um, but I don't necessarily feel that we need to summarize each of the speeches. Yeah, I think I think that would be perfect way to go okay. about it. So more or less, um, well, now we're in Plato, right? So we've officially transitioned from. Well, it's a difficult transition, but we are on our way to transitioning from literature to philosophy. Um, and Plato is interesting, as we were just talking about, in that he's writing dialogues, which are more like dramatic, they're, they're dramatic works, they're more like plays than they are like philosophical texts, but they're plays about people debating philosophy. Um, part of the difficulty with Plato is, again, that he speaks through all of the different characters at once, so the reader um, is fundamentally asked to figure out in the course of all of the speeches and all of the lines by all of the philosophers, there's, a, there's an attempt to tease out the truth through the depicting of a drama of two pe people discussing 
truth. Um, and it's very difficult for that reason. Um, Plato is easy to read because it's like a play, but it's, I think, difficult to come away with the right message because Plato is very um, esoteric um, and very on purpose. And I think that's why Nietzsche likes him so much is that just like Nietzsche, he's hiding the truth underneath the words. Um, so we're finding ourselves about a hundred years after, um, after tragedy. Um, I, I think it might be more on the lower end rather than the higher end of a hundred years, maybe like 80 or something. Um, but more or less, um, gosh, and I really don't know the history of, of the fourth century as well as I should. Um, but I think more or less, and this could be totally wrong. I think more or less we've gotten to a sort of stability that enables philosophical discussion just in the culture of Greece that perhaps wasn't around before. And maybe we should, you know, look this up before talking about it. But there is the, certainly the idea that philosophy comes from leisure. And especially in fourth century Athens and all of the characters that are in this book, they're all um, upper class elites you know, living in Athens and that particular culture has a lot to, a lot to bear on the content of what we're reading, particularly tonight when we're reading the symposium mm -hmm. and talking about that. So there's a lot of peculiarities about Athenian culture that come in um, that are not necessarily universal to, Cre to Greece, but not necessarily the opposite either. Um, so, so anyway, uh, the dialogue we read for tonight is the symposium, and the symposium is really interesting because unlike some of the dialogues, it's reported to us through a character who had it reported to him by another character. So it's like we're getting a third-hand account of what happened at this dinner party, more or less. Um, and that's how it basically starts out with some guy I think is I think Apollodorus. Yeah, Apollodorus is asking Aristodemus to recount what he heard about this party. And Apollodorus was under the impression that it had happened recently when in fact it had happened many years ago. And so then Apollodorus has er has um Aristodemus recount this story that he heard from somebody else. Um to him because he wanted to know what it was about. And so, so Aristodemus is telling us this story of more or less how, um, can I interject real quick? Sure. Sure. One of my favorite things about the text was the first sentence of the text. Mm. When uh, Apollodorus speaks and he says, this is just no context whatsoever is given. Um, and he says, I think I'm quite an expert in what you're asking about. Yeah, it's like we really start in medias res. Like it's right in the middle of the conversation. And I think Plato intends that to be towards the reader, not towards um, the dialogue necessarily. Hmm, what do you mean by that? Um, I was thinking when I first read that line, uh, I knew that the symposium was about love and conversations about love. Um, and that line struck me as uh, I'm quite an expert in love mm. and that I, as the reader, am asking about it by opening this text. Because it, it comes out of nowhere. It's just the first sentence of the book. And I was, I was like, I didn't ask a question. You know? <laughs> but I yeah. guess that's exactly why I'm here to ask a question. Um, and I, I don't know, that struck me right from the get go. Well, it, it sets the tone for later because ultimately love is the only thing that Socrates claims to know anything about. Yeah, and I, I think we'll, we'll get there eventually. But I think for the, for the man who said he who is wisest is the one who knows he knows nothing, mm -hmm. um, to say that uh, he's an expert in love is a fascinating paradox. It is. It is. So anyway, we're, we're, so we're getting this story secondhand about a dinner party. And what happens is that Socrates, who is, I think in every case, the, the main character of Plato's dialogues, 
Plato was the was a student of Socrates. So you might think of Plato as an un an unwritten about participant in many of the discussions that happen about happen in the dialogues. He was probably there and he probably based them more or less on real conversations and then dra dra dramatized them and brought in new characters to bring in new points and things like this. Um, but we hear that Socrates is on his way to go to dinner at Agathon's house. And Agathon is um, kind of, he's a tragedian, in fact. So he follows Euripides in the chronology of the tragedians. And I do not believe that we have any of his extant works. Um, Agathon is also interesting in that, I, again, we don't have his extant works, but we have commentaries that were written and comments written about Agathon's work. And he's one of the only two, I believe, authors that ever wrote an original story of Greek literature that we know about. All of the rest of them pulled from myth in some way. So Agathon's interesting in that he's a tragedian and he's also attempted at least once perhaps to write an original work rather than um, to retell something from Greek mythology. And so Socrates is on his way to dinner and it's the day after that Agathon had won the city Dionysia competition. So his trilogy of tragedies and satyr play had won the first pl first prize. So um, Can I obviously he's quick? a smart guy. The the introductory remark you made about Greece having changed in this time period, um, our, or at least my translator said that Agathon's plays had a modernizing spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that that lends some credence to a different context that we've entered in entering this era. Indeed, and, and it probably would have been a helpful transition piece to read some of Euripides because there's a marked difference between the tragedies of Sophocles and Aeschylus and the, the tragedies of Euripides. It really, it starts to become more modern and psychological. Yeah, and it, it also becomes, and it becomes a uh, questioning of the essence of the myths. Mm -hmm. uh, what's taken colloquially that the myths mean. And we'll see that when Socrates, um, account of love goes against Hesiod's right. genealogy of the gods. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's also an esoteric point there because he's not the one saying it in the story. Right. But we'll get there. I right. apologize. I just wanted no, to no. lend to what you said earlier, that there something's fundamentally changed about the culture that we're reading. Right. And the and, people we're talking about. And it's changed to the point that we can now start doing philosophy and not myth anymore yeah and a, a certain amount of irreverence is acceptable mm -hmm. and questioning so questioning so they're on their way to, to to dinner at agathon's house and there's this kind of interesting you know kind of tidbit at the beginning that you know socrates is on his way in and he's with his companion and the companion was uninvited to the dinner but Socrates is kind of lagging behind and tells the companion to go in, go in ahead of time. And what seems like several hours pass because they actually finish dinner by the time Socrates comes in and more or less we're led to, we're told that he had a thought come into his head. So he just stood there processing the thought before he would move on. Mm -hmm. um, and later in the story, we hear that he did this once for an entire day. And yeah. Then and in the morning, people watched him walk away from the place where he stood still when one thought popped into his head. For 24 hours, yeah. So I don't know necessarily what that contributes to the drama other than perhaps to indicate that Socrates is, one, kind of weird, but two, deeply possessed in his craft, which is philosophy, and that when he speaks authoritatively or asks authoritative questions, um, it's little little snippets like this lead us to believe that Socrates is actually, he's, not, he's definitely not like the sophists. He actually thinks things through and is profoundly affected by ideas and is profoundly attempting to 
come to the truth about something in whenever he talks um, with his interlocutors. He really so, is a true philosopher in the sense of the the love of wisdom or the eros of wisdom. I find that in my personal experience, I, I do philosophy and then I sort of enter back into the real world and let that slide away. Right. Socrates is sort of philosophy personified. Indeed. And that becomes even more significant at the end of the dialogue, as we'll get to in Alcibiades' <laughs> speech. And um, we will repeat that again. And we will repeat that again. <laughs> um, we'll get to the end. All right, perfect. So, so more or less, they're all super hungover from the day before when Agathon actually won and they got super drunk. And these symposia were supposed to be drinking parties where you more or less, there was a rigid person who was in charge of determining how much everybody drank and it was like mandated you couldn't get you couldn't try and be sober at one of these things it was like mandated drunkenness but more or less they're all so hung over that they agree just to drink casually and not according to the rigorous fashion of of a traditional greek greek symposium and normally at, at a symposium you would you bring in some sort of entertainment after dinner so in this play it's a, a flute girl and ultimately the the participants at the party are like you know what let's not do this let's let's amuse ourselves with something else so they send the pipe girl away and they decide to give various each they decide that each person is going to give a speech in praise of the god love ultimately the question of the symposium is what is love <laughs> <laughs> and um and so we, we get uh, a, a numerous, uh, we get a couple of speeches um, by various personages. Uh, five. Before five. Indeed. And it's cool because they're all sorts of, they're, they're different professions. Um, and I don't know all of them, but we have a doctor, we have a comedian, we have a tragedian, and then we have Socrates, and then you also have some other guys. Um, and what's so interesting is that they give totally different accounts of love. So in Phaedrus, um, Phaedrus's speech opens the opens the the party, and Phaedrus is more or less ascribing um, or taking the Hesiod genealogy of love to be the most real. And he has this reflection where he, and maybe we should situate this context a little bit better. But in Athenian Greek culture, the ideal relationship was actually of an older man and a younger boy who was post-pubescent but barely um, and in the upper class circles it was kind of it was commonplace and the idea was you give sexual as as the beloved you give sexual gratification to your lover in exchange for more or less uh, his social network potential promotions teaching you wisdom, virtue. Um, so it's very different. Well, it's just, it's, there, we don't have anything quite like this in, in modern culture because they're not homosexual, except in rare cases. They are heterosexual. They have wives and, and children, but they enter into these homosexuals with younger boys. Um, and there's, I guess, a lot we could talk about there that is probably not necessary. Um, but more or less, um, Phaedrus argues that this kind of relationship is perfect, and it's the perfect expression of love. And because there's nothing that a lover would want to do in front of his beloved that would cause him shame, and vice versa. And so he makes the claim that if you had an army that was made up of nothing but lovers and beloveds, that they would be able to conquer the whole world because never would they, they would rather die than be shamed in front of their boyfriends. Um, and he also, he, go ahead. he goes on to reference uh, Achilles and Patroclus. Yeah. And I, I had that line underlined, said it's merely an exaggeration to say that they could not conquer the whole world. Mm. Yeah. Well, and, and it should be said too that. This, this interpretation of Achilles and Patroclus being lover and beloved is, um, you know, we read the Iliad. It's not there. It's 
what you, I mean, it's more or less anachronistic. The Athenians do this, therefore all Greeks throughout history must have done this, therefore Achilles and Patroclus were lover and beloved. Um, for my own reasons, I think that that's not accurate, right? We're talking about more or less. It would be like us looking, you know, ha having our cultural norms and then looking back at somebody 500 years ago and ascribing to them the same kinds of social institutions. So it's not necessarily the most academic or credible interpretation of the relationship between Achilles and Patroclus, but it was one that the third, fourth century Athenians did indeed hold. Yeah, it, it offers a sort of post hoc explanation of yes. myths, which uh, we started with talking about Agathon's modernizing spirit. Um, Posenay's speech is very geared towards myth and making sense of love in terms of myth and the eros being the primordial element which enters with earth and chaos mm -hmm. to create the universe. So I think we see throughout the speeches, not that they necessarily move linearly, but a movement away from describing love in terms of the past and finding new ways to describe love. And then I think that climax is with Socrates. Right, there is, there is sort of a narrative arc in some ways to these, to these speeches, um, because we go straight from Phaedrus to Pausanias, who adds something to Phaedrus, and that's kind of, well, he, 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 he t talks about love, right? Is love is the companion of Aphrodite. And there's two traditions about where Aphrodite comes from. And I think we talked about this a little bit in when we talked about Hesiod's Theogony. But the first tradition is that Aphrodite is the first of the Olympian gods, and she is sprung from the froth that comes from the genitals of Uranos when they're cut off by Kronos and thrown into the ocean. And then the other tradition is that Aphrodite is one of the daughters of Zeus. Um, and so. Pausanias gives a reflection on these two different kinds of love, one being celestial and one being more base. And it's the base one that is heterosexual, and it's the celestial one that's homosexual. Heterosexual relationships governed by the basic Aphrodite are for merely the sake of reproduction and the, the keeping of society, keeping society going. But the heavenly Aphrodite overlooks these, um, these homosexual relationships between older men and younger boys. Um, Which is certain to trigger someone listening to this. What? <laughs> it's certain to trigger someone who's listening to this. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it was interesting when, but I think when, when well, if I can just qu quickly interject here, when I when the when the whole scandal with Milo Yiannopoulos broke, <laughs> and everybody freaked out, and you know he lost his job at Breitbart and stuff, um, because he said in a podcast that these coming of age relationships for younger gay men were actually really important in their development, regardless of whether or not you think that he's right about that, there is certainly historical precedent for saying so. Yeah, and he was also talking about the 80s. Yes, he was. Which was the pre-gay rights movement. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, th I think it gets to the, the fundamental relationship that men have with men and women have with women that are distinguishable on average. That in a, in a diff they're different types of love. But I think one of the fascinating things about juxtaposing Pausanias' speech with Socrates' speech is that during Socrates' speech, he's speaking through uh, Diotima, who is a woman who's teaching him about love. So completely contrary, Socrates says, or Socrates learns about what love is from a woman. Indeed. So, Indeed. Uh, there is that subversive element to it. And, and it's interesting because, um, well, it's interesting because Aristotle point blank condemns this pederastic relationships um, and kind of contentiously Max and I have been were trained that because of the amount of 
texts that were lost from both Plato and Aristotle, the best way to understand them is to understand them together. Mm -hmm. um, and so you might wonder if, if this is Plato's nudge that, that agrees with the Aristotelian stance that these relationships are bad. Certainly. Because 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 they're degrading so much of women, and it's precisely because of the suppression of women so much that these relationships flourished in this century. There's there's also that I think that Socrates' speech through Diotima is the most compelling speech in the book. Well, yeah, it's the most interesting for sure. And so when these men get together at a drinking party and give these highfalutin sort of deifications of love as this primordial, ultimate, perfect thing. Um, it, in the end, is a woman who speaks truth into them. If you hold Socrates' account as higher than the other ones. Indeed. And I found, I found that subversive, like you said, but also, perhaps in an esoteric sense, lovely that Plato was seeing something that we sort of intuitively know today. Right. That the, there is, the celestial love is certainly not male because right. so often the nurturing element, uh, and you see this statistically with what careers men and women go into, is within women who become uh, nurses and occupational therapists and so on. Um, and I don't want to get into the weeds there, but... I think that perhaps if Plato is taking Socrates' speech to be the best uh, in terms of truth, then he's taking a woman's word to be the best among men mm -hmm. about love. And I found that extremely compelling. Well, even if it's not Plato saying it, it's clearly Socrates who's saying it. Mm -hmm. Right? Socrates is clearly saying that he, he literally quotes Diotima for, this, for the but more or less the, the whole speech is actually just Diotima's speech that Socrates is recounting. And during his uh, recounting of his conversation with Diotima, he places himself in the shoes of everyone who's spoken before him mm -hmm. um, in the sense that he thought that love was as they were saying and not as Diotima was saying. Right, precisely. And so what... The, the claim that Socrates was, was towing, or the line that he was towing as, an, as a youth or uneducated before learning from Diotima was actually the content of Agathon's speech, which I guess we'll jump to that one and then go back to, we definitely have to talk about the Aristophanes speech because it's just so interesting. But Agathon more or less makes the claim that um, Love is the most beautiful of the gods and also the youngest of the gods because young people are beautiful. Um, is to, 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 to reduce the whole speech down to a little sentence, that's kind of what it is. And that's the position that Socrates wants to refute. Um, but if we could discuss first Aristophanes' speech, this is, I think, of, of the early speeches, it's certainly the most memorable. Would you agree? I... I had a very strange agnosticism while reading the speeches until I got to Socrates' speech. So I'll have to hear your reasons for that. Um, though sure. I so, the well, poetic of the speeches. Mm -hmm. So Aristophanes is a comedian, and we have comedies of his that survive. Um, I think the funniest one is the Lysistrata, which I don't know if you're familiar with it, but more or less the Spartan women go on strike from having sex with their husbands to get them to like stop fighting or like to come back something about that. It's like ending a civil strife by not having sex with their husbands. And so Aristophanes writes that. So he's a comedian. And what's interesting about this particular story is that he actually tells a tragedy, which um, in the context of the last paragraph of the, of the play are, is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. So, so Aristophanes, he's a comedian, tells this story where human beings originally were spherical creatures with two heads, four arms, four legs, um, and they were powerful. And Zeus was afraid of how powerful they were. But 
didn't want to kill them off completely because he liked the sacrifices that he offered to them. So he sent Apollo to go cut them in half. So they wouldn't be spheres anymore. And, and then threatening the gods. Right. So that they would be less powerful and not threaten the gods. Um, and then more or less Hephaestus has mercy on them because they're all they want to do is hug their other halves is that he turns their heads around so that they face one another. And I think it's kind of like he gives them their genitals back so that they can have sex with one another so that they can yeah. embrace one another, but it wouldn't be a perpetual embrace that would lead them to starve to death as if, as it would have been if their heads were still turned the other way around. Um, and I think the text says he moves his, their genitals from the rear to the front. Something along those lines. Say that again for me. He moved their genitals from the rear of their body to the front. Right, right. Um, and uh, can I quote a line here? Sure. Right. He says, uh, love draws our original nature back together. He tries to reintegrate us and heal the split in our nature. Indeed. And, and the thought is, is that there's three genders. There's male, female, and androgynous, right? Halfway between the two. And once we were cut in half, the males became two men, the females became two women, and the androgynous became a man and a woman. And the thought is that we spend our entire lives seeking our other half. I wanted one of the fascinating things about this text is I found four or five places where their reflections were just matching evolutionary theory. But in basic evolutionary theory, like male and female become necessary for procreation because they're different uh, genetic natures, which has a lot to do with hormones and various other things, um, created a survival advantage. And I found this sort of like split case um, of like the gods splitting men and women in half to be um, interestingly opposed to that. I, I apologize, this idea is not fully formulated. No, but no, I mean, I think, I think what's interesting about it though is that while it is certainly not biologically true, it certainly feels true, right? It feels like we are searching for our other half and once we've found them, it's like we're made whole again. Oh, um, okay. I've got it back again. It's it's that both natures are necessary for being to um, persist. Mm -hmm. I think that that was it. It was um, two different natures coming together is where we find unity. And um, I can find the place, but there's another speech in which it said that disorder within a thing creates harmony and he uh the author whoever it is is talking about music it's sort of like the different rhythms of tone mm -hmm. high and low and which creates the unity of a song so it's sort of like an opposition within men and women which in the end create unity well and i think i mean i think that's true right i mean I, I am I am a firm believer in the compliment complementality complemental com, compl complementary nature of the two different sexes. It's like we both have a genius, and when they're brought together, fourth being. But beyond that, it also Aristophanes says in his speech, "Love is just the name we give to the desire for and pursuit of wholeness." Mm -hmm. And that was, I think that was one of, cause, because in the end, I agreed so much with Socrates' speech. I thought it was brilliant and beautiful and really insightful. But before I got to there, I found so many um, gems. And I, that was one of the ones that I highlighted, that there is an incompleteness about being an individual. and there is perhaps an overly romantic sense in which 
the unity of two is the searching out of wholeness. And maybe we can come back to question that idea when we get to Socrates' speech, but I did love Aristophanes' account of love in that way, that, that we were divided beings and we required to seek after something which would make us whole. Well, and I think that's actually very in line with what Socrates says later. It's just that the object of love is contextualized, right? In Aristophanes, it puts kind of physical sex and reproduction as the extent to which love is, I don't know, operative. And what Socrates does is, I mean, I, I feel like he actually just continues from Aristophanes's point and says, Aristophanes is right. However, there are these other things in there, are these other um, kind of horizons of activity in which love operates that mean that there's more to the story. Yes, precisely. I was going to say that Socrates' concept of love is amoral, whereas Aristophanes' concept of love is moral. Mm. Um, Socrates' concept of love allows for things like love of evil, love of power, love of manipulation. Whereas Aristophanes, uh, this divided search for wholeness, frames it in a way that love can only be a good thing. Mm. Yeah, I, that's an interesting point. And I want to kind of push back because I don't know that Socrates would say that there is such a thing as love of evil. Hmm. I think, or love of manipulation. Because I, I think what he would say is that because love has an object, that even love of another human being, it participates in that ultimate love, right? That form of what love is, the desire for beauty, more or less. Um, I, I think insofar as evil is not beautiful, you couldn't say that there's such a thing as love of evil. But It's not love anymore. Doesn't Diotima say that um, just because love itself is not beautiful, it's that which strives for what is beautiful? That um, So love lacks beauty. And we'll Indeed. get to exactly Socrates' uh, contradiction of the previous speeches with that point. But wouldn't that open up the possibility for love of things that are not beautiful? Because love in itself is neither good nor bad, neither beautiful nor ugly. It is a intrinsic pull towards what one is lacking. And couldn't one think that they lack power or control? or wealth. Um, and maybe we're using the word love differently here. I think we I think we must be because there's certainly in Socrates's account the mo the moral aspect of love is actually what allows him to because love is moral, he's able to make the argument that he that he does, right? It's the love of the beautiful or the desire for beauty, which we are lacking, is what inspires goodness in a human. See, I read that as can, not is. Mm. Um, and this is great, because I think this is the first time we've read a text differently. <laughs> and yeah, I think so. But I read that as love is not in, in itself good. Um, would you like to reference any speech before we move into Socrates or maybe we could go back no let's just let's just keep going okay perfect um Socrates speech in Socrates speech he he talks about how love includes the desire for something and then he asks um a pre a yes to Agathon does someone desire something that they already have and Agathon says no and so, therefore, love must be lacking something because mm -hmm. it cannot be whole in itself because it desires an object. Um, and therefore, love cannot be this perfect thing. And then we get with Diotima's account the, that love is born of poverty and wealth. Mm -hmm. And wealth is the father and poverty is the mother. 
So love is this imperfect thing that can be neither wealthy nor powerful. It's this intermediary between um, sort of wholeness and protection and comfort and destituteness. And I thought that because love is not beautiful in itself, that doesn't make it bad, is a the point they make. That uh, it doesn't necessarily make it bad, but love could still be oriented towards the wrong thing because it could you could love something that is not beautiful and seek after that thing because you're lacking it you could hypothetically at least i thought reading the text love something which is bad or immoral I'm going to have to sit with that. I don't know that I agree, but I can't necessarily point to something in the text that says otherwise. Um, though, hmm. well, that's what's interesting about, well, see, actually, here I think here's a way to push back. It's that there's that series when he's debating with Agathon and not debating, he's asking Ag Agathon questions so that they have a, a, a mutual footing upon which he can deliver his speech with Diatima. And he asks, you know, if somebody is a mother, it's proper to say that they're, they are a mother of someone and father, father of someone and brother, brother of someone. Um, and uses that to indicate that, there is an object that is proper to love. Mm. And then goes on to make the claim that the object that is proper to love is ultimately, after ultimately the ladder of loves, the ultimate object of love is beauty. And what that does is inspire virtue. I totally agree. I just think that um, the object of love could be otherwise. And I think that the object of love, given the way that people behave, is rarely beauty. Right. Otherwise, we wouldn't be left in this condition as humans. And perhaps, I mean, I think that one of the things Socrates does, and maybe this is where I'm getting it from, is the other speeches try to deify love, to make it perfect, mm -hmm. to make it only desirable. And I thought that Socrates' speech made love, um, it made love neither perfect nor imperfect, which if the ladder of loves, which we can describe, is preferable. Neither perfect nor perfect, it's the object of love that's ultimately perfect. And yeah. love is just, it's the daemon. That, but, but the that, corollary seems to hold that a love of something could descend into wickedness. And, th and that's probably true. And that's probably the other side of the conversation that we don't see in this one. Mm -hmm. It's like the implication is that because love has a proper object, if you love anything other than the proper object, it leads you to vice. If the love of the proper object leads you to virtue. I could get, I could follow that. I like that logic. Um, yeah. Although there, there is a piece of evidence that goes maybe towards your account, and that would be that the, quote, love of evil would, would not be love, properly described. Right. We would describe that as passion or mere desire or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's when uh, Diotima describes that ignorant people don't love knowledge or desire wisdom either. Because the trouble with ignorance is precisely that if a person lacks virtue and knowledge, he is perfectly satisfied with the way he is. So maybe it still does hold love as the aim towards something beautiful. Um, and that which is other than love, such as ignorance, um, doesn't think that it lacks anything. So maybe that in, in your case's defense, that would mean that uh, you could not love evil because that wouldn't be love. Right. And, Just as... and I, I, I like that reading better because be, precisely because of the way that it moralizes love. Mm -hmm. um, that, I mean, it, maybe it's just a preferential thing, but, um, you know, let's talk a little bit about, um, a little bit more about 
Socrates' speech, Diotima's speech, really. You know, I would say the thesis, well, I mean, we, maybe we should just, let's recount the ladder of loves. So ultimately, Diotima is making the claim that love is a school, right? And that love has a proper object. And if you love the object in front of you well, it teaches you something and then perfects the object of love. So ultimately, you begin by loving one person's body and you recognize it as beautiful and you long to possess it forever, eternally. And then what that teaches you is that there is beauty that exists across multiple bodies. There's more than one beautiful person. And thus you learn to seek and possess physical beauty, not simply embodied in your beloved, but across everyone. And from there you learn that there's beauty that is, exists in the mind of your beloved in that they, yeah, they have a beautiful mind. They create beautiful things with it. And you begin to things in the minds of all the other people. And what that ultimately culminates in is a love that makes, is a love of the thing that makes all of those things below it beautiful, namely beauty itself. And it's a beautiful passage when Diotima describes what that beauty must be like. And mm. it's once you've, once you've catched but a glance of beauty, all of those things before which reminded you of beauty pale in comparison. And that, once you, and that, that you could never long to behold anything in the way that you long to behold beauty, the, be, the beautiful itself, beauty itself. Um, and ultimately what's, I think the driving motivation here is, and it, you know, kind of goes without saying, as we were talking about at the beginning, philosophy is the love of wisdom. And ultimately the symposium is about the question, what is love? But it's also about the question, what is philosophy? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the claims of the symposium is that beauty the love of beauty is the path of the love of wisdom and the reason why you love beauty is because it creates and generates things that are good hmm. right so especially a beautiful mind for example creates poetry Laws is another example of things it's, it creates. Music, tragedy. Those are good things, and they're good precisely because they're beautiful, and they're generated from a love of the beautiful. And you learn goodness through beauty. And the love of, and the love of wisdom is what seems to me just the path of understanding the good and the beautiful. It's also the, the scaling of those phenomena. It's sort of that there, when, once you understand- In proper places. Yeah, once you understand beauty as in a physical object, and then many physical objects, you begin to realize that beauty can manifest in something that's not physical, but is mental. And then that is not merely mental, but views beauty itself. Um, yeah, I'm, I think I'm kind of, I'm kind of confused. What what do you think the relationship between beauty and love is in the dialogue? Because the the first speeches want to make love synonymous with beauty. It is in itself beautiful, and Diotima describes it as it strives after beauty and that that striving scales to more and more beautiful things right i mean it, would, it seems to me that love is the thing that teaches us how to apprehend the beautiful and so that love is 
it ultimately plays an, a, a role in bringing us forward and upward along the ladder of loves. But ultimately, love, love is the desire of, the, of beauty itself. That's what the proper object of love is. And therefore, love is the mechanism by which we become good and by which we become wise. To use the old language, by which we become holy. Hmm. Right. Um, what do you think differentiates love from will? Hmm. Because that was... Well, I think a lot. I mean, I think the difference between... I mean, and this is why I think that Socrates' Diotima's speech kind of follows quite nicely from from Aristophanes is because she doesn't ever contradict that it's that desire for wholeness. It's just it challenges what object actually makes you whole. Oh uh, yeah, and but there but there's something more to her speech, which is that love because it strives. Has, it strives for something, and part of that striving is for immortality. Yeah, and immortality is comes from procreation, and she doesn't mean procreation in the limited sense, but procreation of an art or um, something beautiful. I don't. Know. There's something, and I think maybe this is just me getting caught up in how many times love is used as a word and the way in which the dialogue uses love as a word. Because the, you know, like the, um, there's a great song by Snow Patrol and in it, he says, those three words are said too much, but not enough. Okay. And he's referencing, I love you. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the problems with dissecting Socrates' speech is that we all come to the dialogue with a preconception or many preconceptions about love. And those can sort of cloud in on what's being described. Yeah, and I and I think I wonder if one of one of the lessons we're meant to take from the text is that if you can if you can appreciate well, maybe this is a Christian moralizing the text. If you can learn to appreciate and love the immortal things like poetry, art, that that it works, that, that the ladder is both climbing up and descending down, right? That once you have learned how to love poetry and art, you can love an, an individual person in a way that you couldn't have before. Hmm. And once you've learned to love beauty itself, you can be you you begin to appreciate the person that you have because they are the instantiation of beauty for you and you've chosen that and i think that's where will enters the picture right because once you've experienced beauty itself and recognized beauty itself across multiple beautiful bodies there's the temptation perhaps or maybe the the thought that you can have licen licentious desire for all of them but that would in fact not be the kind of virtue that plato and aristotle encourage upon us which is one of moderation right and so it's willing then to appreciate the instantiation of beauty in a physical person with one person as aristotle claims is the height of or not maybe the height, but one of the good, one of the moral consequences of having a properly oriented love. Hmm. I'm just, I guess I'm sort of struck by the neglect in Socrates' speech of the ugly or the immoral. There, I love the claim that's made that the striving after beauty uh, creates immortality. In other words, it's the beautiful things that end up surviving and not the ugly things. But it, it would seem that the more one understood beauty, the more one would understand its opposite. 
and I I didn't hear in the text what the opposite of the opposite of love would be in that sense. Right. Well, it would seem that, and it it would seem that kind of Plato or Socrates or whomever in this text is is precisely saying that there is no such thing as the ugly with a capital U. Hmm. Right? It's there is nothing and then there is the beautiful. And where the beautiful is lacking, that's what ugliness is. It's not that it has an ontological status in and of itself, which is precisely why you couldn't love it. There's no object there. It's a nothing. Oh, it's the absence of a thing. It's the absence of a thing. The privation of beauty is what ugliness is. And I think, I think that that would have to be the case or else you could, or else there would be such a thing as love of evil, love of wickedness. Hmm. But both Plato and Aristotle would argue, I think, that those are not things ontologically speaking. There's no object there. That's, I mean, I think this is the path, the passage that you were referencing early, earlier about um, Diotima's description, but she talks about the person who is no longer a small minded slave. Mm. Uh, instead, he faces the vast sea of beauty and in gazing upon it, it is his boundless love of knowledge that becomes manifest. Mm-hmm. Um, that's very interesting. It's, it sets love, so there's sort of like disorder or ugliness that we are slaves to, and love is that which draws us out of slavishness. Right. Or, and, that, and, and that's where we were talking about, that's, that's the room for the will. Yeah, the faculty which draws us away. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like love prepares the will to operate properly. Because a slave does not possess his will. Mm. He is subject to the will of others. The opposite of love would be slavishness to that which is not beautiful. Mm -hmm. It would not be love of something else. Okay, I can see the point then. So that's interesting. So there's there's a fundamental identity then between properly oriented love, i.e. love, and freedom. Yeah, and the freedom is born of an act of procreation. Mm-hmm. That's what I mean. That the concept of immortality comes into his speech, and in the end, he says, "In the business of acquiring immortality, it would be hard for human nature to find a better partner than love." I found that extremely fascinating. It was, you know, how there's there's existential questions. What if life has no meaning? and so on, the things that can torment people. Mm -hmm. And yet, in Socrates' speech, he describes love as creating something in which lives on beyond your mortal nature. Right. Or the faculty which allows you to move beyond your mortal nature through time in an immortal way. And that's what's so remarkable about it all, right, is that and I think it's good, maybe good for us as modern people. We don't have an immortal out. We don't have an immortal outlook. But maybe if we did, we would be more concerned about the things that we did on the day to day. There's that great line in Gladiator where Maximus yells out, "What we do in life echoes in eternity." <laughs> and that's pre-Christian, right? I mean, he's he's a he's a Roman pagan. Um, but I think the idea is the same. And I think, and this is what's so cool about just the works of Plato in general is that identity between the good, the beautiful and the true and the concept of a a robust, real concept of a forever that means something, right? Why, why would you act morally? It's precisely because those actions echo in eternity. And there's something at stake 
by being immoral. And I'm not even necessarily trying to say heaven or hell. I'm talking about the evil that we commit today will echo through the ages. And we have no idea the extent to which our wickedness will impact those who come after us. Hmm. And, and, I, and I like that about Plato, and I like that about Aristotle as well. That goodness is, it has a consequence. And it's a consequence that we moderns have lost because we don't understand forever. It's like we're, and, and I'm trying to kind of say this tongue in cheek, but it's like we're, we're selfish, right? We think about only ourselves and our immediate surroundings and we forget that, you know, we have, we will have children and they will have children and they will have children. And it's naive to imagine that we can get away with anything and that they will get away with, and that they'll, they'll be just fine, no matter how good or evil we were. Hmm. It's I, the, the love described in the speech is generative, but it's only generative in the sense that it pulls one away from itself towards an object, which, such as beauty, which in turn forces the procreation of immortality. It's, it's sort of the, it's sort of ego dissolving in that sense. Yeah. That well, it's like the knowledge. ego dissolves in the object and the, is then given its nature back. Hmm. Because the eye doesn't go anywhere. This is it's, sort of, oh no, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to, this sort of reminds me of, um, Buddhist compassion meditation or often called love and kindness meditation and in the meditation you start uh, by wishing yourself well and I think the one that I know uh, the most is the verses may you be loved may you be healthy may you be peaceful um, and I think there's one other one and then in your mind you're supposed to bring your attention to another person whom you like a lot and say the same thing, and then to someone you dislike, and then to a group of people. And there's a phenomena during this meditation where the compassion towards an individual, or a friend, or an enemy, or a group of people is sort of identical. That, that there's a, um, a subjective experience, that the compassion towards yourself is the same as your compassion towards humanity. Mm -hmm. And I think that Perhaps there's a sharing insight with Socrates' uh, version of love, which is love sort of dissolves outside of the individual. It's neither it's not it's not made different um, by its object. No, not by its object. It's um, no matter love's aim, like towards beauty, um, perhaps the beauty of an artwork or the beauty of creating an institution that lasts a long time um, and works to create virtue. Like that, that love isn't constrained in its object. Or no, in its creation, sorry. It's infinitely generative. There's and, no end to the thing, the beautiful things that love can create. Yeah, and therefore it's infinitely individualized. Mm-hmm. Because that which an individual procreates isn't constrained to a single field or a single relationship. Its, its generation applies to the particular aptitudes of an individual. And so I think, in a sense, the call to love in Socrates' speech is a call to that which you can procreate that is immortal, as set apart from what someone else might be more apt to procreate. Mm. Well, this is interesting, right? Because directly at the end of, gosh, are we even going to get to Alcibiades? Maybe we will. But at the very end of the dialogue, you know, the, the narrator wakes up, uh, you know, kind of more or less at like six in the morning, hung over his shit. And Socrates is still up talking with Agathon and Aristophanes and making the argument that the perfect poet embodies both tragedy and comedy in himself 
and is both a tragedian and a comedian. And he's talking to Agathon, the tragedian, and Aristophanes, the comedian. And that's juxtaposed against the fact that Agathon's speech is a comic satire, and Aristophanes, the comic poet, tells a tragedy. Um, <laughs> and I think in particular reference to this, it's, I mean, what is it? It's that both of them have the obligation to create beautiful things with their talents, with their arts. But there's precisely also, and perhaps this is the claim, that despite the fact that there is a beautiful thing which is in your nature to create, there is always something else you need to integrate. That you're never fully you hmm. or something, right? There's, there's always a, a calling forth to embody another form of art or another form of beautiful creation that you do not yet possess. And so that you can begin to climb the ladder of loves yet again with another sort of immortal creation. Yeah. And I think the point also, there's this sort of interesting interplay between tragedy and comedy. Uh, comedy, if, if you just consider the topics that are often touched in comedy, it's tragic. It's sort of, makes light of the human condition and all of its ills and yet tragedy there's something funny about it mm -hmm. there's something humorous about tragedy um i don't know maybe i could think of laughing at agamemnon because he murdered his daughter in order to conquer troy right you know like there's something funny about that you could make light of it and i there's there's sort of like a if you become well versed in the um, performance of comedy or the creation of comedy, you become well versed in understanding the tragic side of things. And right. the opposite would hope. So, yeah, there's sort of a internal missing dialectic between the element in you which is most strong, and yet it's opposite which shares in the element not necessarily it's opposite but it's complement oh it's, it's a, i don't think I'm sorry it's apparent opposite like it's surface opposite right surface opposite yeah and, and and perhaps that's the thing that love is supposed to teach us that or or the beautiful perhaps is supposed to teach us that those things which appear to be opposite might be complementary <laughs> I mean, certainly that's the case with, with, um, with Socrates himself, who is ugly and yet has the most beautiful mind. I really, really enjoy that, that um, idea. And it, it plays into our perception of the world. Um, and we'll get to this in the Republic, but our perception of the world in the cave for instance, that laughter and sadness are opposed to one another. And paradoxically, there's a sense in which things that are beautiful come of things that are ugly. Or no, complement things that are ugly. It, mm -hmm. It's sort of like the exact juxtaposition of things allows them to exist. Mm -hmm. um, in a world of only beautiful things, that could not be a beautiful thing. Right. Well, and this, and this just seems to, to echo the, is it the Heraclitus fragment about conflict, struggle, being the father of all and the king of all? Hmm. And it's, it's precisely when when apparent opposites stand over and against one another, they come into their own and they find that they maybe have something more in common than they thought before. Indeed, there's the sense that our perceptions of abstract concepts such as love or hatred, beauty and ugliness or tragedy and comedy are not 
opposed in the way in which we feel that they're opposed. Right. And I think the and part of it. Is, well, and part of the call of the philosopher is to enter them into a dialogue together so that you can move forward and become a more moral person. But I sort of feel that this concept is unnerving in the sense that there's something sort of relativistic about it, too. I don't know what to make of that. But how could a great comedian understand tragedy and vice versa? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's sort of making light of what we are so detested by. Well, Jordan Peterson says something interesting kind of about this, and he says that serious topics should be dealt with as light of a touch as is possible. Um, and that whenever you lose your capacity to be witty or satirical, when you're talking about something serious, that's precisely when you've fallen into ideology. <laughs> um, right. Right. Uh, I mean, I think I think that that's so true. I do as well. It's like, yeah, it, yeah. It's it's precisely the most serious, stern, and unrelenting person that we find the most humorous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. Uh, so I mean, I think in that way, I mean, that could be what Plato's trying to say. There is that, you know, the comedian needs to be in his funniness needs to talk about serious things and the tragedian with his serious object needs to be mindful of needs to be funny hmm. Hmm. it's sort of interesting in the sense that you can turn those things on themselves i guess in the as i tried to do with agamemnon um you can make humor out of sad things and make, I guess you could make sadness out of funny things. Right. Well, and, and it would seem that the obligation is to do so, lest you fear losing the object itself. But it, is either tragedy or comedy more beautiful than one another? In the sense of love seeking after the true form of beauty? Well, that's what's interesting. I mean, that's what seems the the claim seems to be that tragico tragico comedy is the most beautiful art form. Hmm. And maybe that's because it so much reflects the the human condition as we actually have it. Thing, life is tragically funny and hilariously tragic <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, and the, those might not be the only um, opposing slash complementary elements as well. Right, there might be a whole slew of others, right? But ultimately, it's the apprehension of beauty that makes those tragico comedies worth telling because if there's no object to those to those productions uh, why bother so exactly in the sense it's it's not that love either produces comedy or produces tragedy it's that whether you're writing tragedy or comedy your aim is beauty uh -huh. exactly so it's it's not the thing in itself, whether tragic or comic. It's the aim in which the thing is created. In other words, um, many of the things that we find detestable in art are pointed towards beauty. And many of the things that we find wonderful in art are also pointed towards beauty. there's the sense that what is what is apparent um and in this case just use tragedy and comedy what is apparently tragedy and what is apparently comedy can both be aimed towards 
uh, the procreation of something worth immortality mm -hmm. that transcends age. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if the point of the synthesis of tragedy and comedy at the end of the symposium is the is hidden within there the claim that. Hmm. Yeah, well, it's it's the reason why you need to understand how and be able to do both is so that you don't find yourself wondering why people find comedy beautiful or tragedy beautiful if you are a comedian or tragedian, respectively. Or something like that. Yeah. I'm there's struggling a, with this concept because... There's just a sense that we have immediate reactions to things, such as... Uh, tragedy and comedy and our immediate reaction to comedy is laughter and our immediate reaction to tragedy would be sadness um but or pity those, and fear as aristotle would say those those that the immediacy of that reaction is precisely in which it misses the point which is what is this laughter or the sadness aimed towards mm. And is it that which is beautiful? Why am I laughing? Why am I crying? And so it's not that a particular human state of um, emotion or sentiment towards something is what matters. Um, it doesn't matter whether you laugh or cry. It matters. It's the think. fundamental orientation of those emotions. Yeah. So sadness in itself is not bad. And neither is laughter. It is the it is that which those things aim, which makes them either worthwhile or destructive. That was quite a lot. Mm -hmm. You want to interject uh, Alcibiades? Yeah, let's let's talk okay. about Alcibiades. Okay. And then, do, do you want to summarize this guy, or do you want me to do it? Go ahead, go ahead if you can. Um. I'll, I'll do the beginning, and then you summarize the speech. Okay. <laughs> the basic, after so just as Socrates has finished speaking, Alcibiades rolls in, and he is extremely drunk. And he, uh, did you read Alcibiades' biography? I did not. <laughs> it's really messed up. Well, I mean, I know about Alcibiades. I mean, he's a ends up being a traitor and he fornicated on a, some statues or something like that. He was, yeah, he was accused of knocking the uh, penises off of statues. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, he left Athens and then um, I think returned to Athens. No. And then he became uh, an overlord in Thrace and he was assassinated. He's, like, he's a, he's a very, He's sort of like a character that, um, in his neglect for philosophy or moderation, just meets his doom. Yes. But he's also a, a beautiful person. I mean, attractive. He's um, looked on admirably by the people of uh, Athens, at least at first. Um, but he sort of, like, he drunkenly enters the party as a party from the street uh, spills over into the house. And um, rather than give a eulogy of love, gives a eulogy of Socrates, which in the end is not a eulogy of Socrates. Um, do you want to take that further? Yeah, well, I mean, ultimately, Alcibiades tells this pretty shameful story, more or less, of how he's in, so in love with Socrates and did everything he could to possibly get Socrates to sleep with him. Because he was enthralled with Socrates' his wisdom and thought that by consummating a relationship with him sexually, he would be entitled to receive wisdom from Socrates forever. So it's what's interesting about the Alcibiades incident, right? And and it's comic and hilarious because, you know, he tells it's like, 
you know, I tried to get, get him to sleep with me. So, you know, I had him over for dinner and, and we talked and we were all alone and I thought we would have sex then. And we talked all night and then he left and then we were wrestling in the gymnasium naked with no one around. And I thought he would get horny and he didn't. So he left. And then finally I had him over for dinner again and I convinced him to sleep at my house and I climbed into his bed and tried to convince him to have sex with me. But it was no different than sleeping in a bed with my brother or my father because he didn't lay a hand on me. Um, And well, what's interesting about Alcibiades is that he has many of the pieces right. And that's that Socrates' wisdom is worth loving and worth giving up, giving something for. But it's like he confuses the hierarchy of, of the loves. It's almost as if because Socrates loves beauty itself, if I can bring him down to the the level of a single individual body again, then I will magically kind of participate in the same kinds of things that Socrates does, namely a love of beauty itself. Um, And you can tell he's very spiteful about all of this. And ultimately it leaves the reader uncertain about I don't know. I mean, what what do you think? What do you think it leaves the reader with? I mean, how did you? What did you respond to when you, after you read this Alcibiades' eulogy of Socrates? I was reminded of myself, um, sort of thinking that the means to wisdom was easy. That you know, you could you could nearly sleep with a wise person, or be in love with a wise person and find wisdom. It's the vice of um, confusing the means with the ends. Right. And he, he's um, a very, he has a very youthful mind in this sense. He thinks that what Socrates possesses is attainable through easy means and that he could gain that from being around him, all the while in his speech sort of describing how he's unable to follow the teachings of Socrates. Right. And even so far as he will try to avoid Socrates so he doesn't have to hear his advice. Mm-hmm. He, doesn't, he doesn't want to have to do the necessary things. To be well, honest. he's Alcibiades is kind of the archetype of the person who hears truth and is inspired. Or, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's much like in, in the parable in, in the Gospels, it's the, the, the seed that falls among thorns and sprouts up very quickly and is then, or it's the, what is it? It's the seed that falls on rocky soil and sprouts up very quickly and then withers and dies. That's what Alcibiades is. Yeah, he's the, he, he is the juxtaposition of eros from love. I don't know if that works precisely, but he he's all he's all of he's all of the the more base elements of love. Yeah. Right, love for status, not because it gives you the capacity to create beautiful things, but because it's self-referential and narcissistic. Right? Love of you know, he's beautiful and that's his ticket in or something like that. And that's, that's something to be proud of instead of just recognizing that he didn't do anything to earn his beauty. He just was beautiful. What, what did you say earlier about what Jordan Peterson said? Um, in terms of, I'm forgetting it was, um, do you remember what you said, what Jordan Peterson said? Yeah, well, I, mean, I just... Oh, it's about ideology. About ideology, yeah. And if you can't talk about serious topics with a light touch, with a humorous touch, then you know you're an ideologue. Yeah, I think that that personifies Alcibiades. Mm. <laughs> he can't sort of remove himself from from a certain disposition towards 
like taking things too seriously. But I think that's why he can't accept Socrates' advice. Right. He's taking it too seriously. Well, because he's, this is interesting, he won't dissolve his ego so as to be given it back again. Right, and that's, and that's kind of like what we were talking about earlier is that's the point of you fall into beauty itself and lose yourself and then you're given it back. Then you, you, you get it back so that you can go create beautiful institutions and have children and love someone. So he's sort of like the personification of a narcissist. Certainly, yeah. It's when hearing wisdom derives the opposite of wisdom. Mm -hmm by always being self-referential in his goals. Because I think Socrates' point in his speech is that um, love cannot be self-referential. Right. It has a proper object. That is beyond the self. And Alcibiades represents the character who thinks that um, the proper love is in himself. Well, there's an interesting foil that's created between Agathon and Alcibiades because they're very similar, right? They're young, attractive, successful. One listens to Socrates and the other doesn't. And um, Agathon moves away from Athens, I forget which city, but to a king who was a great patron of the arts. Philip of Macedon. Yeah. Right? And, uh, Is that right? Yeah, I think so. And um, to the contrary, Alcibiades moves to Thrace as an overlord and gets assassinated. Yeah, becomes a traitor to Athens. I don't know if that could be right that he went to Philip of Macedon, but it might be. That might barely work out from a time persp timing perspective. Um, oh, King... Archelaus of Macedon. Oh, so Philip's father. Interesting. I think is that I don't know if that's his father or not, but it's an ancestor. It's certainly close because Aristotle's yeah. the leader of Alexander. Yeah, exactly. Nonetheless, I think Alcibiades represents a sort of insistence on missing the point on uh, what what philosophy is he he enters the dialogue in this sort of drunken and obscene way and while revealing the true character of socrates still never seems to understand it mm -hmm. he he can describe um, socrates and his wisdom but in some sense, he can't alleviate his own narcissism, his own um, self-importance. Well, it's, he, he reminds me in a lot of ways of both myself and colleagues of mine when we were freshmen in philosophy class. Well, please go on. Well, it's, you know, we think we're so smart we enter into these conversations and we feel good about ourselves because we can talk other people's points down or tease out things from people's arguments that they didn't know were there. And we think that we're gaining wisdom as a result. When the fact of the matter is that until philosophy humbles you, and if you do it correctly, it will at some point. It definitely did that to me. Until you get there, <laughs> you're so from the truth that you're not even doing philosophy, right? It's like the difference between, I don't even, I, what, would the, what would the word in Greek be? But instead of love of wisdom, it was, it's love of self. And what's so fascinating is that those two are so, so close to each other because being a being endowed with intellect, it's so easy to fall in love with the creations of one's own intellect as if they're the greatest things in the universe. When the reality is, is that the only reason why the creations of the intellect are good is because they participate in something that's so infinitely greater than the human intellect that 
we can't even really imagine that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it reminds me of the character in Plato's Cave who only makes it part way up towards nature. Yeah. And returns back down to the cave to show how wise and brilliant they are mm -hmm. to people who are staring at objects on a wall. Yeah, well, there's, there's definitely a, a great um, parallel, or not even parallel, the story of the Ladder of Loves in Diatima and the story of the cave are very analogous stories. Hmm. And, and you almost, you, you, I think you can read both as a commentary of the other. I think so, too. It's, I think the other thing, and this is sort of where we began um, in this podcast, is that we, we began by reading the Iliad with these like, extraordinarily rich men who were like, extremely good warriors, powerful. And now we get to the place where the most powerful person in the room is this ugly, um, very strange and peculiar man. Who doesn't wear shoes? Or, yeah, and wanders the streets of Athens, speaking to people in questions, and in no way other than humility, constantly humble. It's a very different kind of hero. If you treat Socrates like a hero, yeah, that's. I mean, that is a really interesting question. What role? dramatically speaking is does socrates play i sort of this is a strange analogy to bring up but what what jesus is to muhammad socrates is to achilles that's interesting there's sort of like these these heroic characters in human history who conquered and spread um their ideology or uh, their version of the truth and then there's these extremely poor humble um humans who have the same heroic status in terms of people's beliefs in terms or, of or sometimes even higher yeah um it it's curious it's sort of like both the most conquering powerful and the most humble and meek are in the end both the most influential. I, I know that would take us far afield, but I don't know. Well, I mean, the lesson there seems to be be humble because it's far easier to achieve immortality from humility than from glory. Right? Achilles is just one of among literally millions of men who have died for their cause. But how many men have been truly humble, like Socrates or like Christ, and have made themselves immortal in that way? It's probably a much higher proportion. I, I'm, I'm sort of stuck on this. <laughs> It's so curious. There's, there's this idea that in order to gain immortality in the historical sense, that we still remember these people, these characters. Um, I have the natural intuition that you would have to um, you know, do something amazing like Alexander and conquer this massive territory or you know, be the king or the ruler. And yet completely equal in our memories is these characters who had no power. I think that might be something to reflect on moving forward through the Western tradition mm -hmm. is how strange it is that both the powerful and the completely humble rise to immortality, rise to us still remembering them right. and even um, honoring them. It's, it's a curious juxtaposition. Um, it's sort of 
speaks to there not being a clear answer. Well, and ultimately, both both the great king and the humble man create something beautiful that is an attempt to strive after immortality, right? The king attempts to create a beautiful institution, the state, and the humble man, well, creates whatever humble men produce, namely, well, wisdom, <laughs> right? Um, I think there's something to be said for that, indeed. It's a strange leveling of concepts. It is a strange leveling of concepts. And I think, well, I think it provides a good moral lesson for we who are stu- for us who are students of philosophy. Um, I would much rather be like Socrates than, well, I don't know if that's true. There's a, there's, <laughs> It's it's like there are two. It's like there are two ways of being in the world, dynamically and boldly and well, and that's that of Achilles and that of Socrates. Hmm. And maybe that's an oversimplification, but it's pick your poison and do it well. I'm reminded of the uh, sort of cryptic cryptic passage in Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments. Uh, in which he says, and the beggar who suns himself by the side of the road has all the happiness available to him that kings are fighting for. <laughs> um, it's sort of fascinating that no matter which way we strive for uh, a kingly role of power or a humble role of seeking wisdom, um, there might be there might be a value in each or um, it might not be the point which one you are. Mm-hmm. And this, it might be a po- the only point is how you do it. And, and, and what you create, about. indeed. Yeah. This is, we already talked about this in terms of love creating both tragedy and comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, powerful people and powerless people in the end can produce their own immortality. And it's not that um, being powerful or being powerless is what matters. It is, as Diotima says, it's that either is aimed towards beauty. And that's why I remember it. Right. The aim of either of these pursuits. So Max, what's, uh, what's your moral takeaway? from from the symposium well now i have no idea <laughs> uh, i mean it we you sort of uh cut down my love's amorality in the yeah. beginning and i was going to draw on that i think what's come from this discussion for me is a reinvigorated sense of not to take things on the surface and you know, it's not whether something is beautiful or ugly, powerful or powerless, as we were just talking about. Is like stop framing things so simply. Because if the aim of a bad thing is towards beauty, then is it bad? And I don't mean bad in the sense of immoral. I mean something that we would reflexively be repulsed by. Right. Um, ugly is probably a better word. Yeah, and uh, to the contrary, um, you know, we can strive after successful careers or um, great relationships or whatever it is, but so long as these things aren't aimed towards beauty, something more, something beyond them, that what we consider to be good might, in the end, just be a futile exercise. And I think we need to see the juxtaposition of comedy and tragedy is a lesson for other elements. Um, Sadness in itself is not bad to experience, nor is laughter. It's the object in which these things come out of. And so I would say, um, 
at least a moral lesson I'm considering, is what object do all of the experiences that we have come from? Mm -hmm. What is the aim of them? Because um, I think, what's that uh, quote from Nietzsche that you put in a PowerPoint that you... (laughs) A man who has a why to live can endure anyhow. Yeah. (laughs) I'll leave it right there. I think dovetailing quite nicely, um, my takeaway, it's very similar to yours, but I think I have a different way of articulating it. It's that I need to take more time day to day to contemplate beauty itself. Um, You know, I like art. I like to go to art museums. I like beautiful music. I like listening to beautiful music. I like poetry. I read a lot of literature. Um, In a lot of ways, I, and I have a beautiful fiance, (laughs) in a lot of ways, I open myself up towards beauty. Um, But I think that I could deepen the effect that those beautiful things have on me by taking the time to think about what my fiance and what Vivaldi's Four Seasons and what a Rothko and a book by Dostoevsky, what makes them beautiful. And if I would contemplate that more, um, then all of them might impact me more than they currently do to act well and in, in accordance with virtue. You've actually you've reminded me of something. I'm sort of along with that. I'm thinking of those moments in our past that are extremely shameful or that we regret, um, or even very just negative states. And in those states, we're sort of consumed by um, how bad it feels or how terrible they are. Um, But I think that often we're struck by the immediacy of a situation, and we think that's all that that situation is. Um, But I think it's from the... It's from the struggles or the falls or the terribleness that we're able to see something more clearly beyond them. Mm -hmm. Uh, You sort of can't judge a thing from being within it. No. There's a necessary distance. Mm -hmm. And and ultimately, we can achieve that distance through contemplation. Even in the midst of sorrow, if we contemplate our sorrows we can achieve that distance necessary to learn something from it. Yeah. Sort of like this is something more than it seems Mm -hmm. both the pleasurable and the painful. This is all sort of something more than it seems. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, I think we might've arrived at a good stopping point. (laughs) Certainly not in my mind, but a good natural stopping point for a podcast. Indeed. I, you know, I, I feel like at some point we should be disciplined and have like a time clock going so that we can know exactly how long we've been speaking. I know it's been at least an hour and 10 minutes because the first time I looked at the clock was at 9.50, but I don't know when we actually began. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, with that, we are, next week we're beginning Plato's Republic, and I think we're planning on doing something a little bit differently. Correct me if I'm wrong, but do we have potentially another guest who's going to join us? Yes. I have a, a friend who is studying education. Um, and we can either make the Republic in three parts or in two parts, um, but specifically focusing on the definition of education in the Republic and uh, maybe talking about the juxtaposition of the Republic and our modern institutions of education. That would be and, fascinating. Um, do you know precisely where in the Republic educa- education is defined? It is right at the allegory of the cave when uh, Socrates describes education not as putting sight into blind eyes, as putting knowledge into something that is knowledgeless or ignorant, but the turning of the whole soul towards that which is uh, the true forms of things or the arising out of the cave. Um, and I'm forgetting which book that is. Book part of me wants to say four, and part of me wants to say seven. So 
I don't know. Ah, four. But right the importance of education. So in, in my book four, I've got a little thing that says the importance of education from like four, like in the middle of four. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, maybe we'll take a brief reprieve from tackling a whole text and just... Yeah, I, I, I'd like to do that. Um, I would, however, for just the sake of keep keep marching through if we could so there's 10 books in the republic if we could do five and five sure um that'd be great um and i also i i would like to march kind of quickly through the republic at least from a scheduling perspective um because we've got so many good things on our list and we got to keep knocking them out or or else we're never going to get there (laughs) So, um, but that having been said, I also want to make sure we take our time. So there's kind of a, a balance there. Yeah, I completely agree. And I don't know if we want to, but maybe we'll think about throwing the apology in somewhere. Yeah, I, I, I thought about it. Um, I think maybe just for the sake of time and that we could just keep moving. All right. Into Aristotle after the Republic, if that's all right with you. Yeah. I just, okay. um, I think it's very interesting. I'm just getting the sense from this conversation how much one has to read all of Plato to sort of understand Plato. I know. Uh, it's such a bummer. But yeah, no, if, if that's the move we make, then that's it. Okay. Um, but awesome. I, I just wanted to thank anyone who might be listening. Yes. And uh, thank you, Doyle. This has been a great pleasure. It has been indeed. Well, um, thanks for listening to Max and Doyle talk about Plato's Symposium. We'll be back more or less next week with books one through five of The Republic, and we can't wait to see you then.